said it before, and I shall say it again, that these who have turned the world upside down are come hither also, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. Charles E. Bradford was born in Washington, D.C., the last of eight siblings to Robert and Edda Bradford, the son of a Seventh-day Adventist pastor and evangelist. A young Charles obtained his early schooling in New Rochelle, New York, where his father pastored a district of three churches during the Great Depression. Charles attended Oakwood College. I said, Charles attended Oakwood College. For his secondary and college training, though he had planned to enter the medical field, at Oakwood, God laid hands on him and convicted him that he was calling him to the pastorate. During the early days of his ministry, Bradford met and married the former Ethel Mackenzie, who is here with us this afternoon. Praise the Lord. They have been married for 52 blissful years. Somebody say amen. The Bradfords are the parents of three children, Sharon, Dwight, and Charles Jr., in 1961, church leaders in Chicago called Elder Bradford to be the president of the Lake Region Conference. During the late 1950s, Elder Bradford won the respect of peers and found himself a leader with a powerful voice in providing opportunities for other blacks to assume leadership positions in this church. In fact, Elder Bradford served on the Andrews University Board for 30 years. That was before it became Andrews University. It was Emmanuel Missionary College. Eight years into his leadership, and coupled with the power of a clear and coherent voice, led to his election by the General Conference as Associate Secretary assigned to the North American Division. In spite of the pressure of his administrative responsibilities, Ella Bradford did not stop preaching. He served as President of the North American Division for 11 years, having been elected in 1979. To this date, he remains the first and yet the only black person to be president of our great division. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. I present and introduce to you Ella Charles E. Bradford. Doesn't get any better than that, does it? I tell you, this music here, I was a little bit worried about you over here at Andrews University. <laughs> I, I come from the great metropolis of Spring Hill, Florida. Down there, we think everybody else is liberal but us. But I tell you, and that's my choir there, I know a little bit about you. And it is glorious to behold. So I feel better about the seminary now. <laughs> you know, I'm a watchdog. You know that. I'm a watchdog <laughs> on the walls of Zion. <laughs> I, I, I go from place to place. I'm rarely home on Sabbaths and weekends. And I come home reporting to Ethel. Honey, it ain't like it used to be. <laughs> and uh, now I'll go back and give a positive report. <laughs> President Ennis, got to get this right now. It's a formal situation. 
been invited up here. Three of us brethren have been invited by the BSAS. And I looked at my plane ticket and they rented me a car. All we had to do was pick it up. I got a brand new Buick LeSabre with two miles on it. <laughs> Told me to stop and get a big dinner. Whatever you need, we're willing to accommodate you. I've been in the work with these brethren here so long, I can't even spend money when people give it to me. I'm scared. <laughs> But I perceive that BSAS is an organization to be reckoned with. What did Daddy Bush say about his son? Don't fool with him. I didn't agree with that, but don't fool with BSAS. They're ready. And uh, my compatriots who with me are being <laughs> lifted up here it's kind of embarrassing because I don't really belong with these brethren, but they tuck me in anyhow. <laughs> I'm glad to be with the boys. But anyway, I feel better today than I have in quite some time about the future of Adventist ministry. Other people close your ears a bit. But Ellen White said, as the ministry goes, so goes the church. I want to say to the budding theologues and those who are recycled, some of you here recycled, you understand what I mean? I want to say to you that what you see is what you made. Don't come complaining to the conference, brethren, about this terrible church you sent me to. Because if you've had sufficient time there, you ought to have in that church a reflection of your own self. I went to a church once, or oh, I was sent. They called me a little boy. I even bought a Hamburg hat to look, look ministerial. Turned up shoes. So anybody on the street would know I was a preacher. They sent me to a congregation that didn't believe in evangelism. They said, the last public meeting we had here was conducted by more prominent preachers than you. We don't see how you can do anything in this town. Well, it's a mighty marvelous thing to be ignorant about some things and not be inhibited by that kind of talk. I couldn't even hear it. You know, in our day, we were so anxious to get out into the work that one more day, even though we loved Oakwood, would have killed us. <laughs> we had to get out, do something. I was in that culture. And uh, I got a good dose of it. And these people, many of them were professionals. A little bit of money of this world's goods and hoity-toity friends. <laughs> I didn't, un didn't understand anything. I can tell you when Earl Cleveland was just a youngster in 1940-something, he was down in Gainesville, Georgia. We were getting ready to get married, and I sneaked away from my bride-to-be and went down to his meetings, Gainesville. 
Had a grand time that night. You know what Celia and Earl told me? Don't go way back up there. Just stay here with us. Now, no holiday in, you understand what I mean? They were living in a trailer. <laughs> and I ought to be ashamed of myself. I slept in the living room. She put up a little curtain, and we talked to that all night long. <laughs> <laughs> so I was ready to go. And uh, pitched out a little tent on the corner. Certain members of the church held back. I'm talking about what's real. I didn't read this in the book. It's real. It's real. I know it's real. Sometimes they drive by a little late. Give a little tip to the Lord to salve their conscience. But I don't know how the Lord blessed. They were standing around four or five deep. Had a nice little baptism. If I had known then what I know now, we'd have had three times as many. You understand what I mean? And after being there a few years, some of our young men went out into one of the county areas, in a dark county we used to call them, and we had a little meeting there, raise up a church. About the fourth year, the brethren said, Brad, you've been there long enough. You got to go and help another district. I said, fine, that's all right. We're not going to give you a tent this year. I said, fine, that's okay. So I announced it to the church board. Most of those people had happened to get themselves on the board by one way or another, you know. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I said, uh, I made the announcement, I will not be having, we will not be having an evangelistic tent meeting this year. Because the brethren think I ought to be somewhere else doing this and so forth and so on. And one of the worst opponents said, the skeptic said, who said, you're too young. You could never match these older men better than you. Said, what's the matter with that conference? Don't they believe in evangelism? <laughs> so what you see is what you made. You can make them ugly and sour-faced and all the rest of that. But I declare unto you, it's hard for people not to smile back when you smile first at them. Now, I, I, got, I don't know how I got on that, but sometimes I have little digressions, and some, some of the seminary fellows told me one year, your digressions are better than the real meal. You understand what I mean? <laughs> But I, I'm still trying to do the best I can. Still trying to do the best I can. And I want to say to my seminarian friends, women and men, I ain't going to leave out the women. Do not let any male chauvinist tell you that you don't have any place here. This seminary was provided from the funds of the church of the living God. And I don't care who you are. Let the church roll on. <laughs> Tell you another little tidbit. When I uh, came on this uh, board here in the early 60s, things were happening. There were some people, don't get embarrassed now, because you've got to have real life. You've got to be exposed to real life. You don't want pie in the sky all the time. You don't know what's really happening, what's going down. Okay? Well, they had people here like they have everywhere, and they didn't think you ought to be here. And they burned crosses on this campus. I can savor the moment. When I told uh, a high official... Well, somebody told me first of all, why are they just some pranks? There ain't no pranks. When you heard your grandma say they put that cross on her yard and hung my great grandfather or your great grandfather, that ain't no joke. And down south they say, you ain't funny. <laughs> but 
But under the power of the Holy Ghost, I told them, this is the Lord's institute. Everyone that names the name of Christ has a right to be here. That's why I say you need to be a S A S. Yes, I love the whole church of the living God. I was in the general conference not long as E.E. Because I ain't old as he is. <laughs> I love the whole church of God. And I can declare unto you that I have been able by the grace of God to have a warm pastoral relationship with every nation, kindred, tongue, and people but I ain't going to sit by while one of God's children mistreats the other child. You can talk about me just as much as you please. But I'll talk about you when I get on my knees. This is the church of the living God. And I say again, don't fool with it. Don't fool with it. And that's why I look at you with love, compassion. I'm here to serve people. Henry Ward Beecher, probably the greatest preacher of, of English speaking preacher of his day, was floundering in his ministry in Cincinnati. And Beecher didn't know what to do. He had a Yale education, had all that, you know, he had all the pedigrees. They used to say that the world is divided into the Beechers and other people. Greatest family. Well, something told him, in fact, it was a man who was his manservant. You know who he was. That he ought to be more concerned for people. He just said, I ask God to give me a heart of love, a shepherd's heart for people. And his ministry took off just like that. That's what we're here for. Serve people. If I can help somebody as I travel on, then my living will not be in vain. That's what you've got to determine. Now, nobody told you to have all sweetness and light. The brethren, both brethren have told you that everybody's not going to like you. And by the way, you are not required to like everybody. <laughs> but you are required to serve them in the name of the Lord. Wish them no ill. And by the way, if you keep praying for them, you really get to love them and almost like them. You understand me? Almost like them. But we got to read this. 6 verse 25, Matthew. And at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Father God, here's your word. You told us to preach it. It's impossible for us to really examine this word and deliver it accurately and effectively without your spirit. So here's my heart. Lord, take and seal it. My lips anoint them. My tongue prepare it to speak your word this day through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sooner or later, the preacher will have to go to the words of the master preacher. Sooner or later. And I'm so happy that I'm here with brethren. I know I'm not worthy to be in the league with these brethren, but I'm so happy to be here with brethren who believe in the ministry of Ellen White. And know how to use it, not as a club. I never heard them use it as a club because they could beat me up about a lot of things. 
If you live with me long enough, you'll have a uh, you'll have a board of a bill of particulars uh, fill up your elbow. But they never use it that way. Always to enlighten and to uplift. But Ellen White says to me and the preachers and the members of the church that the words of Jesus are more important than any other portions of Scripture. Jesus' words. Sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of life. Let me more. That's what the people crying in the pew. They're crying. Let me more of their beauty see. Wonderful words of life. And by the way, when you get into the words of Jesus, you're going to be led to the parables. Because he never preached without a parable. All the seminaries today are getting into narrative preaching. And Jesus told stories. The kingpin story, you know what I'm going to say, I see you laughing. The kingpin story is the narrative of the ten bridesmaids. All of his parables are first and last about the kingdom of God and its nature, its function, how it operates. Now, in this narrative about the ten girls, young women, Jesus uses a word. My English friends like to use the word around me, second. Jesus seconds a word. That means he takes it over. You see, when Jesus used the word, he took it over. When he made it uh, the main theme of his talk, his sermon, uh, that means that that word had meaning because he infused it with meaning. This word sticks and it grips and it it really uh, moves us when he said, Midnight. Midnight. Old Saul rules the day. I, I'm thinking about the Olympics now. Uh, the old son, according to King David, rushed out in the morning, leaped off the block like an Olympic runner. Goes through the day, dominates the day for 12 hours or more or less, and then he disappears in his journey behind the western sky. And uh, you don't see him, but he's still journeying. He didn't stop because he's out of sight. He moves on as far as the rope, the tether that God has placed on him. See, God still rules the sun. He said, I set you to rule today, but I rule you. He rules the sun, and when he reaches a certain point out there, God's tether turns him around 180 degrees, and he comes on back to his former position. So he goes out, and he comes in. He goes out. And he comes in, and the journey continues. He will reappear after he reaches that midpoint. That's what midnight means in the scripture, midpoint. Then he begins his journey back again, still under the control of the Almighty. Well, I just want to break this up a little bit so we might remember a few points. Because if I get to going off on this sidebar and that good point that comes to me, and when you stand up, everything is an illustration. And you can remember, when you're standing up looking at people trying to reach them with the gospel, all kinds of things come rushing into you. Old man Tinley, C.A. Tinley, in Philadelphia, that's a great man. Tinley! Charles Albert Tinley. Pastor and founder of Tinley Temple came out of slavery. Learned Greek under Dr. Russell at the Temple University. Come on now. Dr. Tinley. 
Then there's a man who was having problems in his church, and he was right trying to scribble down his sermon one day, and all of a sudden he was crying about it. All of a sudden the window shade came down, and Tinley wrote, as the preachers like to say, took pen and put it to paper and wrote. Nothing between <laughs> my soul and the Savior so that his blessed face may be seen. Tinley had an argument yes, with some of his deacons and trustees, and he didn't know what to do. And so he had just gotten a refrigerator, the first one with that thing on top, you know. And Tinley pulled out an ice cube. He wanted to get a drink of water or whatever and cool it. And while he was studying his message, his sermon, he went back, and those ice cubes were all melted and Tinley said, I can't tell where one begins and the other ends. And Ellen White said, she fixes it up. After I read everybody else, then I come back to read Ellen White. And she says, come out out of the frigid cellar. Let the son of righteousness get the icicles out of your soul. And so Tinley went in the pulpit and preached on the warm love of God. Tinley. Bishop Tinley. You know, I got into it, and I forgot exactly what I was going to say about Tinley, but that's all right. If it comes to me, I'll break the sentence. Bring it to you. But the midnight cry. You cannot exceed and excel the words of Jesus, our Savior. He, he said it just right, and so uh, this... Midnight is a frame of reference for all of Adventist activity and life. We're always living in the shadow of the midnight cry. We're anticipating every day the midnight cry. And by the way, folks, uh, please don't get all mixed up in things that don't help us. I want my preaching to be helpful to people. Sister White says, we must turn away from a thousand topics that invite attention. These are matters, there are matters that consume time and arouse inquiry, but end in nothing. The highest interest demand the close attention and energy that are so often given to comparant, uh, comparatively insignificant things. Trivia. Fall de raw. May have a little spark, but no steady nourishing light. And she says, when we are talking about Christ lessons, from first to last, we're talking about issues weighted with eternal power. Issues. Preaching this third angel's message is not a light job. Now, I have too much humor. I know that. People tell me all the time. Been told that for some years. If Sister White were here, she'd say, Brother Bradford, I haven't seen any improvement in you yet, <laughs> as she told some. But my only comfort is, as Spurgeon used to say, if you know how much I repress, then you give me a medal. You understand what I'm trying to say? <laughs> but that's the frame of reference. Here is the impending advent of midnight, yeah? We talk about the close of probation. We don't talk no foolishness, do we? The close of probation. We talk about finishing the work. I'm so happy to be at Seventh-day Adventist because when you get into this message, your, your vocabulary changes. The lexicon of your words changes. 
and you can take words from out in the world and transfuse them into our community and give them new meaning. So people, when they say, I'm in the truth, ain't no way in the world you can understand that unless you are in the truth. <laughs> and, and sociologists tell us that the dynamism of a community is exhibited in its language. And by the way, old Adventism always called everybody brother, sister. Hmm? And I'm going to make some people mad maybe when I say no man is your father. Only one, that's Jesus Christ. I better get off of that. It's really not anywhere near my sermon. <laughs> but when the parable progresses, it opens up something that we must consider while the bridegroom tarry. Inherent in these parables is an apparent delay. What did I say? An apparent delay because I heard somebody said there's nothing too hard for God. God is not caught unawares. God isn't caught, pulled up short. God is never surprised. So is he? No, he's never surprised. But we are faced with a, an apparent delay because we are weak. We cannot see beyond our noses. We sometimes get a little upset. And like the children who, with mommy and daddy, are driving across the country or to another state, the children after a little while say, Ah, ah, daddy. Are we almost there? And in our weakness we cry out, Are we almost there, Daddy? Why so long? Why does it take so long? Well, it takes a little longer than you thought. But don't be surprised because Jesus said, The man, in one parable, The man went on a long journey. You thought it was a 60-yard dash, but it turned out to be a marathon. You didn't take much nourishment because you thought the next day you'd be there. But you found out later on you better get in a measure of oil. You better take in supply. Not just something to nibble on, but you got to have a real meal. Are you listening to me? And what I like about these brethren, watch my voice now, I'm sorry. <laughs> what I like about my brethren, their preaching that I've been exposed to here these uh, couple of days is they didn't give us no snacks at the fast food place. <laughs> they gave us a good sit-down meal. You could take it home and, and ruminate on it. <laughs> and it would nourish you for a whole week. And for the journey that lay ahead, so I say for my English-speaking background, brethren, there is an interregnum. Y'all ought to say amen. There's an interregnum. There's a pause. There's a parenthesis. There is, we're between the already and the not yet. And over in Revelation 6, you remember, the falling of the stars took place, the shaking like a fig tree shakes unripe figs. And then after that, there is another vision of the Christ coming on the clouds of heaven. And between 13, verse 13, and verse 14, there is a parenthesis here. We're between the already and the not yet. That's where we are now. And the preacher said last night that you can't get any chart, devise any chart that will tell you how long it is between the already and the not yet. Are you listening to me? He told us not to try to figure that out. What did you say? Not to what? You gave it to us. And then... While we're going through this, Jesus profiles us. I don't like profiling. I've been profiled before. 
They had me profiled when I lived in Chicago. They, it wasn't racial profile, and I don't get mixed up in that, because I'll tell you when it's racial. But it wasn't racial profiling. It was, you know, it was ministerial profiling. I had lived in the city of New York, and in New York you can't give a preacher a ticket hardly. He almost had to rob the bank before the police will give him a, a ticket. What are you laughing at? You know what I'm talking about. I used to pastor Tabernacle Church, lived in Long Island, drove to Tabernacle, and we made the wrong turn every Sabbath day. We broke <laughs> the laws of New York every Sabbath. Never bothered about it. One day, uh, the man was there. The man was there. He picked up, got everybody, a long line of people. When we got there, I pulled out my Bible <laughs> and in my license. Always the Bible first. He said, oh, Father, I'm so sorry. You just go right on, you know. <laughs> but I got to Chicago. And they didn't know Joseph or Joseph's son. <laughs> and my wife, Ethel, made me drive through the south side where we lived yesterday. And I saw 79th and Cottage Grove where Two-Gun Pete grabbed me. Nab me because I turned on a oncoming traffic. Didn't give him a chance to get started. I was on my way to a Bible study or something like that. You know what I mean. And so I had to go faster than any man. The king's business demands haste, you see. And so I was on the way, I was on the way. But uh, Two Gun Pete didn't know a thing about it. Nab me. And that happened two or three more times, and they took my license. I'm old enough now to tell it. <laughs> I'm not in the work anymore where the brethren can dock me. You understand what I mean? And so, so I had to live with that thing. I had to learn. Profile me. It just seemed that they knew in that great big blue Pontiac that I had, Bonneville, they seemed to know this is some preacher. And so they had me going, well, Jesus has profiled us. He's profiled you. He said, while the bridegroom tarried, they all got sleepy. The preacher got sleepy. <laughs> the deacon got, the elder got sleepy. Everybody got sleepy. And it goes on to say, they all slumbered and slept. Now you deep down in the land of Nod, when you slumber and slept, 